Music is all around us, but why? Where did it come from and why has it changed so much? This is an exploration of the history of music and a look at the incredible power music has to preserve stories and myths across generations and cultures. In this documentary, we will embark on a fascinating journey through history, examining how people have used music to tell their stories, to connect with each other, and to create cultural traditions that endure over time. From some of the earliest known musical instruments made from animal bones to the grand symphonies of modern times, music has played a pivotal role in shaping human culture and keeping our most important stories alive. Stories that are older than writing stories that go back tens of thousands of years. So please sit back, relax and enjoy a cup of tea as I prepare to inspire you with the fascinating story of music. And welcome to Crack and Fruit. The history of music is a fascinating story, irrespective of its impact on mythology, religion and storytelling. It spans thousands of years and touches on almost every aspect of human culture, from the earliest known musical instruments made of animal bones to the grand symphonies of modern times. Music has played a vital role in shaping our societies and keeping our most important stories alive. In the most ancient of cultures, music was often used as a way of connecting people whether it was through communal singing or playing instruments together, although the very first instrument was the human voice. It was almost certainly then followed by clapping or the banging of rocks or sticks on something. The sense of social cohesion from this was incredibly important as it helped create a sense of belonging and identity within communities at all levels from the youngest children to a social gathering of elders. And as human societies grew more complex and diverse, so did the role of music in our lives. Now, one of the oldest forms of musical tradition that still exists today is that of the sand people of Southern Africa, who have been using song, dance and rhythmic patterns to tell stories for thousands of years. This tradition continues today with Many sand communities still rely on music to connect with their ancestors and pass down essential cultural knowledge from one generation to the next. And in ancient Egypt, music was closely tied to religious beliefs and rituals. The ancient Egyptians believed music could help heal the sick, calm the troubled mind and communicate with the gods. This belief in the transformative power of music is still very much alive today as evidenced by the growing popularity of alternative therapies such as sound healing and music therapy. In ancient Greece, music was seen as a way of expressing emotions and ideas through melody and rhythm. The Greeks believed that music could have a powerful influence on human behaviour and society, and they developed a sophisticated system of musical notation to help preserve their most important compositions for future generations. Now as human societies continue to evolve and diversify, so did the role of music in our lives. In medieval Europe we see the introduction of musical notation on a stave and with this music started to lose its dynamism. The consistency that came from this was used to spread religious beliefs and reinforce social hierarchies allowing the message of God, the Abrahamic God, to be replicated irrespective of the church you went to, whether in the region or country or even continent. And with this impact of music and worship, we see many churches and cathedrals being built with elaborate acoustics designed to enhance the beauty and power of this sacred choral music. By the time the Renaissance then arrived, music had become more secular and became seen as a form of entertainment and self-expression. We see that the rise of the great composers such as Mozart and Beethoven created some of the most enduring works of classical music that we still enjoy today. And then by the time of the 20th century, music had become even more diverse and 
eclectic with new genres and styles emerging every year from jazz to rock, hip hop to electronica. Music has continued to evolve and adapt to changing cultural tastes and technologies. Today, music is ubiquitous in our daily lives, from the pop songs playing on the radio to the soundtracks of our favourite movies and TV shows, whilst the way we consume and experience music have changed dramatically over time. But one thing remains constant. Music can still connect us and bring people together. But today's music seems to lack the storytelling aspect, or at least doesn't tell about myths and legends. For now, most songs are about heartbreak and love. Now imagine for a moment how music might have been experienced by people who lived centuries or even millennia ago, before the advent of modern recording technology. Music was but a fleeting and ephemeral thing, passed down from generation to generation through all traditions and communal performances. 200 years ago, your ancestors may have never attended a formal concert, and before the invention of the phonograph in 1877, we have absolutely no recordings of any sound, which means that without music being written down in some form, we would have no idea what music sounded like before this. One fascinating example of this is Johann Sebastian Bach, a composer who wrote the infamous Staccato and Fugue in D minor. Well, he published a book in 1722 called The Well-Tempered Clavier and wrote down the music which shows melody and rhythm. But it doesn't show a tempo or have any indication of how loudly the music was played. And so today we see performances of this work played in different ways, both softly and loud, both slow and fast. We have no idea how it should have sounded. And so 1877 marks a turning point in the history of music for the first time recording and reproducing sounds with remarkable fidelity became possible, allowing people to listen to their favourite songs repeatedly without needing a live performer or instrument. But this new technology also had some unexpected consequences. As music became more widely available through recordings and distribution, it starts to lose some of its emotional depth and cultural significance. Songs that were once communal and participatory became commercialised products, with artists and producers striving to create the perfect sound for mass consumption. And so, when did the writing of music start? Well, some academics in this field believe it was an Italian monk named Guido who first wrote musical notation that would seem reasonably familiar to us today but he only wrote notes on a stave he didn't include information about this speed the loudness or the expression of the piece just the notes that should be played and there is also no indication of whether that piece was a work for a solo singer or a choir or how it should have even been sung the evolution of musical notation also played a role in shaping the way we experience music today in ancient times, music was often notated using symbols and the mnemonics that conveyed only the most basic information about pitch and rhythm. One example of this is St. Augustine, who in 400 CE drew a wavy line indicating pitch above some text. And so, as music becomes more sophisticated and composers created more complex and nuanced works, we see that it would have been harder for performers to interpret these works in a way that was faithful to the composer's original intention. One fascinating example of this is the music of ancient Greece from around 2000 years ago, partially reconstructed using surviving artefacts and historical accounts, and I'll link a video of this in the description below. And while we may never know exactly how this music sounded, what has been Recreated gives us a glimpse into a time where music was an integral part of daily life, used to accompany rituals and celebrations and, well, even athletic events. Today, technology plays a significant role in how we shape music and that musical experience. 
from digital streaming services to immersive virtual reality experiences. Music has never been more accessible or diverse than it is today. But as we enjoy this convenience of music and the variety of music, it's worth remembering that the rich cultural traditions that have shaped this art form over thousands of years and perhaps also how the setting, the environment and the social cohesion of people playing it has affected this music. Imagine for a moment what it might have been like to be a member of a hunter-gatherer society, living in a small group and travelling vast distances in search of food and shelter. Music would have played an essential role in daily life, providing a means of connecting with others and expressing emotions through rhythmic patterns and vocalisations to help with walking or doing tasks. The first musical instruments were likely simple percussion devices made from natural materials such as stones or hollowed out logs, which may have been the equivalent of clicking the like and subscribe button today, which brings a metaphorical tune to my heart. Still, these were not portable instruments and not suited for nomadic lifestyle. So instead, we see instruments developed that were lightweight and easy to carry, allowing people to play music while on the move and after moving great distance. And one of the earliest known examples of a physical musical instrument is a set of bone flutes found in a cave in Germany, which are dated to around 40,000 years old. These flutes were made from the bones of vultures and other animals and are believed to have been used for communal singing and dancing, possibly dancing around a fire, much like if we went camping today. The human voice was also an important musical instrument in ancient times. It was, in fact, the very first musical instrument with people using a variety of vocal techniques such as overtones or guttural clicks and throat singing to create unique sounds and rhythms. These vocalisations were often used in ritualistic contexts such as healing ceremonies or religious observances and helped to develop a sense of community and belonging within the group. In many cultures we see music closely tied to dance and other forms of physical expression. For example, the Sam people of Southern Africa use intricate songs and rhythms to describe their environment and tell stories about their ancestors. And similarly, the First Nation Australians have a rich vocal music tradition that incorporates elements of nature and the dream time, their version of mythology. And then we see in the Ainu, who are indigenous to Japan and Russia, a unique form of vocal music known as Hupopo, where a number of people sing a rhythmic and repetitive vocal pattern that mimics natural sounds. These cultures often did not have a term for music. There were terms for how people express themselves through song and dance and other forms of musical performance and perhaps emotions tied to that performance. But they didn't refer to it as music. They would often reference the purpose of music as its name. These performances were often communal and participatory with people playing instruments or singing together, allowing them to create a sense of social cohesion and shared identity. This music was emotional, dynamic, influenced by the landscape, the environment, the social feeling of the group playing it. Playing music this way allows you to sing the same song with the same group of people, but it has the flexibility of allowing it to sound differently each time you play it. And for me, well, I see this as a good thing as whilst Musical notation today is practical, hearing music played precisely the same way all the time. Well, it can also move some of the charm. Songs can become dull with time because they remain consistent. But there again, sometimes the charm can return when we hear what we call cover versions of the songs, showing that changing the way a song is played can be influenced by factors such as emotion and mood. And so imagine another moment, what it might have been like to be a member of an early farming community, 
living in a permanent settlement and working the land to produce food and other resources. As people settled down and lived in larger groups, music became more structured and complex, reflecting the changing cultural and social landscape of these new societies. The shift from hunter-gatherer to agriculture had a profound impact on the way people experienced music, with more permanent settlements and larger communities, people could develop more sophisticated musical instruments and performance techniques alongside that. And this leads to the emergence of specialised roles such as musicians and composers. And as society becomes more stratified and hierarchical, music also began to play an important role in reinforcing social norms and values. In many ancient cultures, music was closely tied to religion and spiritual belief, with elaborate rituals and ceremonies incorporating song, dance and other forms of musical expression. The development of written notation, though, allows for the preservation and transmission of the more complex musical compositions, enabling civilizations to pay people be musicians and composers creating more sophisticated works that large ensembles or choirs could perform and with this instruments became more sophisticated and physically larger from the creation of bells and gongs to lutes and lyres. In many cultures music was also closely tied to dance and other forms of physical expression with people using rhythmic patterns and vocalisations to accompany communal activities such as harvesting or celebrations like weddings or funerals. And as societies grew more complex and diverse, so did the role of music in daily life, with new genres and styles emerging that reflected the changing cultural landscape of the time. From the solitary lute in the ziggurats of Babylon to the courtly music of medieval Europe, music has played an essential role in shaping human culture and expressing our deepest emotions and desires. And whilst the technology surrounding us has changed how we experience music compared to thousands of years ago, it is worth remembering the rich cultural traditions that have shaped this art form over these thousands of years. And one of these traditions has persisted all this time because if you ever find yourself at a wedding reception there will often be a first dance along with the bride and groom's favorite piece of music this is an absolute throwback to the times of singing and dancing at the early wedding ceremonies long before the christian church in fact we still see in many cultures a wedding dance a dance which is often a form of fertility dance to increase the chances of the wedded couple conceiving on their first night together. And I'll link an example about the Epic of Gilgamesh in this video's description as well, which is a fascinating piece to listen to. And although not based on any archaeological finds of music, uh, it's based on how the instruments at this time sounded and the style of music we believe they play. And so maybe similar to songs heard in Babylon around 4,000 years years ago. One of the most interesting and to some controversial aspects of ancient myths and stories is how they have managed to persist across generations despite being passed down through oral traditions without the aid of writing or recording technology. And I'm often challenged to explain how these stories manage to remain consistent and avoid significant corruption over such a considerable length of time and the answer lies in poetry which you could think of as a song without instruments or melody but poetry can have music played along with it and poetry has rules like any song and these rules the candence the rhythm the meter the syllabic beats all allow poems to be remembered without the need for them to be written down and there are many examples of this from the epic of gilgamesh Homer's The Iliad and the Odyssey, Hesiod's Stilkney and Works and Days, to the poetic Edda of the Old Norse, the Rig Veda from India, the Avestas from Iran, these all were written down 
in poetic forms, reflecting that they were easy to remember for their respective cultures, and so therefore easy to recite. And the fact is that many of the earliest texts we have from different cultures are about their most important things, their myths and their religion. And most of these, certainly those that are pre-Christian, were written down as poetry. By embedding complex narratives and poetic forms into these structures, ancient storytellers were able to create works that were easy to remember, easy to recite, and would remain consistent over multiple generations. But with the advent of writing, the need for the skill of creating poems transmissible through oral tradition lessened, which resulted in the use of music as a mnemonic device, reducing to a point where it was no longer necessary in our modern world of written and recorded media to remember these stories. And now our most important stories are recorded forever in various forms, but not poetry. And this explains why the narrative of many songs today is at best limited. However, we haven't lost the skill to perform this feat to prove that remembering such stories come naturally to us in this form. Or, or perhaps we have evolved to memorise and recite these tales due to finding people more attractive if they can. Either way, I think we should have a short quiz now to show you that we still have this skill. And I'll start by asking you if you can tell me the following line from these songs. I won't tell you the song title, just the first line. Bar bar black sheep, have you any wool? Hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock. Hell lossy, and by no means least, the marvellous Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Now, if you said responses like, yes sir, yes sir, three bags fall, or the clock struck one, the mouse ran down, or Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, then you have proven the point I'm making about myth and religious stories. Because when was the last time you actually sang along to those nursery rhymes? For some of you, it may have been recently if you have small children. For others, a year ago, maybe five or ten years ago, perhaps even twenty years ago. Yet, you still remember the words. And so when people say, there is no way myths or stories could be passed down generation to generation, not without significant corruption, then I argue they can if they are in a poetic form and were repeated regularly. But people may still challenge this idea and ask, how do we know these stories were in musical form when we have no recordings of music before 1877? And the answer to this is because of how these stories were written down when they were first written down. You see, if the stories were in the style of prose with no structure or metre, then they would have been written down as prose. But the first writings were the most important. They recorded the most essential information and the most incredible stories. But the writing down of stories now has meant we've lost some of these skills in writing poetry, this cultural richness. And it was Socrates who said of things being written down, well, then... Those who think they can leave written instructions for an art, as well as those who accept them, thinking that writing can yield results that are clear or certain, must be quite naive and truly ignorant of prophetic judgment. Otherwise, how could they possibly think that words that have been written down can do more than remind those who already know what the writing is about? But there still could be challenges to the idea that myth wouldn't change, as surely it would over time. And we need to remember that because the poem, or song if you prefer, has a metre, a rhythm, and there are rules about it, it means that changing the words of a poem would result in a noticeable corruption of the story. You see, if we sang Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty flew to heaven, you would know it was wrong. It wouldn't fit, even if you didn't know the song. And so, not only do our myths and stories persist due to being sung, they persist because the rules of the song, the poetic metre, and whilst today we like rules around rhyming, 
The more ancient poetry relied on various aspects such as the number of syllables in a line or in a stanza or alliteration of words. And so to alter a poem, whilst it is possible to be done accidentally, for example, Humpty Dumpty could have had a great haul, and this almost certainly happened with some poems at some time, but, but to alter poems deliberately and so the story contained within them would change deliberately, then that would have taken great skill if done purposefully. You know, it, it was a very deliberate act if that occurred. And such instances do occur. And there's a great example of this in the Old Norse texts of the Poetic Edda. In the poem called the Volospol, the, the first poem of the uh, Poetic Edda, there is the last stanza, which is often said to have been added or altered because of this lack of fit. And it's clues like this that allow us to consider poetry a really good source of accurate historical mythical information because corruption within it can clearly be seen. This is one of the reasons the Poetic Edda is considered a better source of Old Norse mythology than the Prose Edda. Music has been on a journey. It started as a dynamic and emotional, albeit somewhat basic composition influenced by social cohesion and change through time and technology to the consistent, repetitive products we see today. But perhaps the most important thing we have lost is how little we use music in social situations. Now, yes, we have concerts, but how many times do you get together with friends and sing? Perhaps going clubbing could be considered an equivalent of this, and this too emphasises the need for social cohesion that music brings. But also, maybe we have too much filler music in our lives via television and jukeboxes, elevator music and radio stations all playing, all just about good enough music for us not to want something else. But before I conclude things, I want to tell you two quotes about music. The first is from Aristides Quintilianus, a Greek who said in 300 CE, There is certainly no action amongst men that is carried out without music. Sacred hymns, specific feasts, wars, marches, it makes the most difficult of handicrafts, not burdensome. And in the 1800s, just a, a couple of hundred years ago, we have a passage quoting a retired agricultural labourer in England who said there was nothing in my childhood only work I never had pleasure but I've forgotten one thing the singing there was so much singing in the villages then and this was my pleasure too boys sang in the fields and at night we all met at the forge and sang when we sing dance or play instruments then it is a participatory act, a social act, the people we are with take part to complete the task at hand. It fills us with joy, whether planting fields, marching great distances, fighting in wars or singing around a hearth. Music flows when people sing and this inspires us to feel good and just feel better. But today music is a product repeatable, much of it controlled through different media outlets. Yes, we have concerts and festivals and nightclubs and despite seeing great bands and epic stage shows, to me, it really has lost its original purpose. Certainly in this form, it is a shadow of what it once was. But equally, the technology, production and skills of musicians and singers today are producing music that 100 years ago would have been unimaginable. And sometimes music is created for that, for a short time at least. But rarely now do we see songs that are considered classical and timeless. I mean, I have played in bands and been to festivals and gigs and nightclubs and listened to music for many thousands of hours in my life. But for me, some of my best and most emotional musical experiences have been sitting around with a group of friends singing songs we could all join in with, often Maybe with just a guitar, but you often don't even need that. I want to thank my patrons for all their support and questions, and I hope you found this video interesting and helps you understand why myths are persistent 
and carry on and how important music is. I'll put links of playlists of music in the description below. Please leave comments on what you like and don't like, but hopefully they give you a, a really good idea of the rich sense of culture humanity has. And I'd, say, I'd really be interested in hearing your feedback on them. And if you like this video and want to watch more of my videos, then this one should interest you. And until you see me again, well, please stay safe and well. Listen to some good music. And this was Crickenford. I came from the mud. There's dirt on my hands. Strong like a tree. There's roots where I stand. Oh, I've been running from the law. Hope they won't shoot me down soon.